I think everything that happens at Park is fascinating. And tonight the fascinating thing is going to be that we get to hear from Marina. I uh, got to meet her at a conference that was on uh, compassion a couple of years ago. Uh, we started to talk. She had studied at Stanford, and then she actually has some experience from a user-centered side, having done tech writing for Oracle, which if you know, must be sort of like coming out of the, the, the gas chambers and hoping that like next time there won't be such an atrocity. So um, at any rate, she's been a journalist for some time, and tonight she's going to talk about her latest book. There you go. And then afterwards, just to let you know, we'll do Q&A with the mic so we can get all that recorded. Cool. Thank you. Great start here. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for coming out. Okay, thank you. I'm curious, uh, how many of you are Bakeye members? Almost everybody. And uh, how many are not Bakeye members? Okay, actually, pretty even mix. Maybe uh, two thirds and a third. Okay, good to know who I'm speaking to a little bit. Um, yeah, I thought a lot about what Bakai represents in preparing uh, my talk tonight. I think a lot about middlemen, obviously, and I think all of us are middlemen, uh, middlemen, middle people in one way or another. And I can tell you, for example, as a reporter and as a speaker, I am a middleman between sources of information that I spend a lot of time reading, interviewing, synthesizing. So that's the one side. And on the other side, um, my audience, you know, my readers and people who come out to listen to me. So I'm a middleman in that way. And as uh, Beikai members, as user experience professionals, more generally, the most obvious way that I think you guys are middlemen is between users who you're advocating on behalf of and um, your employer, you know, the company, the client, the design team. And I hope and I believe that as you listen to more of what I have to say tonight, you'll see other ways that you might be a middleman that you might not have thought of and ways that people around you are middlemen. So I think we all are middlemen and it's really a question of what kind you are. So I have two goals today. One is to explain why the internet did not do away with the middleman and in fact made middlemen more prevalent and more valuable and also to explain how it is that middlemen actually do create value. And that's a, a big answer to why middlemen will always be with us, the ones who are doing a good job anyway. OK, so 1995, big year for Microsoft. Bill Gates releases Windows 95. Some people would say inflicts. Windows 95 on the world. And at the same time, he has time to write and publish this book, The Road Ahead. You guys remember this book? Are you old enough to remember this book? OK. This is all about Bill Gates' predictions of what technology will bring about, what changes to the economy, to society more generally. Um, this newfangled thing, the information superhighway. Will, will herald. And he believed that one of the big things that the internet would do is to make middlemen obsolete. Now, a lot of people were saying this at the same, at the same time, and, and people were always eager to get rid of the middlemen. You know, who wants middlemen? You can just deal direct. And Bill Gates was probably just the most famous prophet. And he actually had a thoughtful argument about this that we can uh, talk about a little bit, which is that. Um, you know, the internet itself would become the ultimate go-between, the universal middleman. That was the phrase he used, the universal middleman. So the thinking was that middlemen, as economists understand intermediaries, um, their function is to reduce transaction costs. 
you know, transaction costs are all the costs involved in uh, making a purchase or selling something. You know, the buying and selling, it takes, it takes time. It takes effort to search out what you're looking for, to assess out quality, to learn about prices. And um, in the brick and mortar world, you know, we'd spend a lot of time driving around, comparison shopping, learning about products. This would take a long time. And with the internet, the thinking was you would just hop on the information superhighway and you'd get all that information you know, right in front of you. You'd save yourself a lot of time. So you wouldn't need middlemen like shopkeepers or brokers, um, matchmakers of various sorts to reduce transaction costs for you. You'd be able to do it thanks to the internet. The internet would reduce transaction costs such that you wouldn't need middlemen. That was the gist of the argument. And it really hasn't, hasn't happened. And I don't want to oversimplify Bill Gates' argument because he was more subtle than that. He did say that middlemen will have to add value. Okay. He didn't say that all middlemen would go away, but to survive they would have to add value. And he didn't say a whole lot about how they were going to do that. And that's really what I'm thinking about. So. I have a few examples for the ways in which the internet has made middlemen more prevalent. And of course, I'm going to tie it up with a statistic, so I'm not just going to throw a bunch of anecdotes at you, but I, but I do want to illustrate with a few of these examples. So LinkedIn, how many of you are on LinkedIn? Okay, let's say almost everybody's on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn itself, by my definition, is a middleman business because it's, it's connecting disparate groups of people and individuals who know each other. And it's enabling search and all that stuff um, a lot faster than you could without this specialized tool. Like before LinkedIn, you know, people had their web pages and you, had, you used a search engine, but it would be very hard to maintain this kind of electronic Rolodex without a specialized tool like LinkedIn. So LinkedIn itself is a middleman, but what I want to point out is that there are a lot of middlemen on LinkedIn as well. So to illustrate this, you know, you guys all said that almost everybody said that you have a LinkedIn account, you know, a, a, basically a resume page on LinkedIn. Now I'm going to ask a different question, which is, who has a paid account on LinkedIn? A handful of people have a paid like a premium account or some some sort of a, there, there's a premium account and then there's something else called talent solutions. And guess who the customer base for talent solutions is? Recruiters, right? So this is such an interesting fact about LinkedIn is that recruiters make up the lion's share of LinkedIn's revenue. Talent solutions, they bring in more revenue. You're saying like, yeah, that's obvious, of course. But you know, the thinking was you wouldn't need headhunters. You wouldn't need headhunters at all because everybody can connect on LinkedIn. Everybody can find a job on LinkedIn. Um, and, and it does give you a way to search. But the key is with these, with professional recruiters, they know what they're doing a lot more than the rest of us. They're much more efficient. They know what to search for. They've got expertise. I mean. Recruiters are middlemen who are experts at finding candidates and getting them to leave their jobs and come to their client's company. So LinkedIn actually has not done away with recruiters, and it's actually made recruiters more efficient, you know, more effective at what they were already doing. We see the same phenomenon, very much the same phenomenon on eBay. Again, eBay too, like LinkedIn, is itself a middleman business. It connects buyers with sellers. People all over the world, you know, if they have a computer, an internet connection, can hop on eBay, search for whatever doodad they're looking for, find a seller, and, and buy it now. Okay, and that still happens, but most of the trade on eBay actually flows through trusted middlemen. So on eBay, this is a category of users that they call power sellers. It's eBay's designation for the most 
experienced, most reputable sellers who do the most volume. And most of these people are not selling their own stuff, certainly not selling their own cast-offs. They are resellers of other people's goods, typically used goods. And the reason that they do so much business is that as buyers, we, we know we trust them. I mean, we see that, um, that stamp, uh, that, uh, that power seller stamp, it really means something. You know, eBay tracks users' feedback scores, as you know, and so you can see that, you know, this person has a 99% satisfaction score, um, and this person did a lot of volume just by knowing that they're a power seller. But anybody with a strong track record on eBay is in that position where they can capitalize on their powerful reputation on the site to um, earn a premium for, for, for whatever it is that they're selling. So again, lots and lots of middlemen on eBay. Another example of how the internet actually made middlemen more prevalent because a lot of these people would not be resellers at all if if there weren't this uh, platform, eBay, to enable them to do that. So another example, social media. This is another one of these internet tools that was originally hyped up as, as a means for people to build up direct relationships with each other, with friends, with customers, with fans, if you're a celebrity, you can still do that, but as social media has matured and mushroomed, you know, you see this, uh, you know, it's, it's a puzzle. It's, it, it can be a full-time job trying to figure out the latest developments in, in Facebook marketing and, and Twitter and, uh, oh, I don't know if Orchid is still around, but, you know, there's all, all of these services. And there's just no end to the amount of time that you could spend engaging with them and learning about them. And so people turn to social media marketers, you know, social media strategists, to publicists. There's advertising on all of these, um, on all of these platforms too. So you know, you haven't even you haven't gotten rid of all of these middlemen. They're just changing their their form. This should look familiar, right? Lovely user interface of, uh, of Craigslist. Somebody 10 years ago, have you guys ever seen this spawn of Craigslist? Um, so uh, somebody decided to track all these uh, startups, all these internet-based startups five years ago, a guy named Andrew Parker, and he pointed out that, you know, StubHub comes from the tickets page and there's Run My Errand and Redfin for real estate and Elance and, and so on. So, you know, the idea here is most obviously, of course, Craigslist does not have a great user interface and that creates an opening for these specialized businesses to create a better user experience. You know, that's sort of the superficial look at it, I would say, you know, they provide specialized search tools that just solve a particular problem, and they certainly are prettier than Craigslist. But what you also notice that, uh, is that a lot of them are middleman businesses. Middleman businesses in the sense of connecting to uh, disparate groups. So, you know, the most famous example here probably would be uh, Airbnb. You know, used to be you'd have to, you know, it would take a long time to find a place outside of a hotel to rent a, a room from somebody. And Airbnb, of course, has made that simple connecting people with a spare room or spare apartment with somebody who's looking for a room to rent for the night. And of course, businesses like this have proliferated. Uber is another famous example, Lyft. And then, of course, we hear of the Uber of this and the Uber of that. I mean, it's this whole on-demand economy is also part of that. A lot of times it's called the peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy, which is a term that is just such a misnomer. Because all of these businesses are really middleman businesses. It's not people transacting directly. There is a middleman 
and it is not just an app. You know, there's a lot that goes into developing the right kind of customer experience that's going to make each of these companies a useful service to both sides, to both the buyer and the seller. And a lot of what I have to say is what these companies, companies like that and middleman businesses more generally must do to provide value to both sides. So I promised uh, some statistics about this. So there's an economist at the Kellogg School at Northwestern who actually looked at intermediation, the effect of the internet on intermediaries. And what, what he did, and I don't know the details of his methodology, but basically his goal was to see the change over time of middlemen's contribution to the US uh, GDP, the gross domestic product. And he found that in 1999, by his calculation, middlemen were making up 25% of the US economy. 1999, of course, was that um, big bubble, the first you know, dot-com bubble. Uh, the internet was still relatively new for most consumers at the time. By 2010, when the internet had grown in every way imaginable, the percentage had risen to 34. So internet is growing, middlemen are supposed to be falling by the wayside, Instead, they're growing in importance as well, right alongside the internet. So there's this lockstep, lockstep pattern. We don't know if the internet is causing that, but we certainly are not seeing that the internet is making middlemen go away during this period. I got in touch with Professor Spolber a few months ago to ask him what has changed since 2010. You know, it's been five years and we've seen the rise of a lot of uh, companies that didn't exist before. And he said he actually had not crunched the numbers, but his hunch is that the percentage has only grown. He sent me an article about Uber taking over the world, this sort of anecdotal evidence of that, for why he believed that. So I, I do believe that middlemen are still very much with us and that they're going to continue to be what, with us and perhaps will continue to take on a larger and larger role. Now the question is why? You know, why were smart people like Bill Gates wrong in predicting the demise of the, of the middleman? Okay, so you remember I said something about transaction costs, about how middlemen traditionally lower transaction costs and the internet was supposed to do that. The internet was supposed to lower transaction costs. You're shaking your head. Well, actually, the internet did lower transaction costs. But here's the thing. The internet lowered everybody's transaction costs. It lowered our transaction costs as consumers and as sellers of stuff. But it also lowered middlemen's transaction costs. And in fact, it lowered middlemen's transaction costs even more. And it, it makes sense. I mean, anybody with a tool, no matter what the tool is, if they are an expert, what the tool gives them is a complement to their skills. It can also be a substitute, but you can't just look at it as a, at as a substitute. So the example that always comes to my mind is, you give me a hammer, you know, and I've got a nail, I will do a better job hammering in that nail using a nice handy hammer. But I don't use a hammer every day. I'll do a decent job. But you give that same tool, that same hammer, to an experienced carpenter, and that person will like drive that nail in in a second and we'll do it perfectly, and we'll be able to build a nice cabinet. I mean, we'll be able to do much more with that same tool than I could. And the internet provides a set of tools for 
middlemen in the same way that the hammer is a tool for a carpenter. So when somebody is more efficient at what they do, it makes sense for us to turn to that person. They have this advantage. And that's why we turn to middlemen, is they're able to get things done for us better, more cheaply, more quickly than we could if we tried to do it ourselves. And it is true that the internet makes it possible for us to do a lot of things on our own, but often we find ourselves wasting a lot of time trying to do things ourselves. And often we'd be better off turning to a professional middleman to do it. Now the question then is, well, what kind of middleman are we looking for? This is, this is like my big question that I was trying to answer in this book. You know, people often despise middlemen. They have very strong feelings about middlemen. Let's cut out the middleman. Or at best, oh, she's just a middleman. Someone who's not really doing anything. But at the same time, you've got middlemen who we, we've seen can be very useful. So how do you reconcile all of that? I started trying to wrap my head around it, and it finally hit me that social psychologists might have some ideas about this. Has anybody seen a, a matrix uh, like this, a warmth competence matrix? Does this look familiar to anybody? Okay, this is a, a set of ideas that was just uh, developed in the last um, five to 10 years um, by psychologists at Princeton. Susan Fisk is, is probably the biggest name associated with, um, with this set of ideas. And uh, it's, it's an, a set of ideas about how we form judgments about others, about people, and also actually about companies. But let's just talk about people. So the, the basic idea here is that we make very quick judgments about people we meet, people we have dealings with, and we evaluate people on these two dimensions, warmth and competence. Now warmth, this refers to someone's intentions. How good are their intentions toward us? Is the person a friend or a foe, right? So the warmer they are, the more we think that they're a friend, they have good intentions, they mean to do well. They're gonna help us. If someone is cold, they're just the opposite. They're, they're selfish, they're looking out for number one. Now, the other dimension, competence, is totally unrelated. So you could be warm and competent, you could be warm and incompetent, you can have all these four combinations, right? Now this is true of our judgments about other people in general. This is a really powerful, simple framework for thinking about how, uh, social cognition is the term, right? How we think about people. And I find that it explains so much about how we think about middlemen in particular. Because if you look at any combination of warmth and competence, you get a different picture in your mind, and it elicits different emotions in us, and it also creates a different set of uh, behaviors. So I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, though I think it's fascinating, but traditionally middlemen have been perceived as occupying this contemptible quadrant that is the emotion, contempt, sometimes disgust even, is the emotion elicited by the parasite. Uh, this is someone who is seen as not on our side, someone who is just interested in themselves, and someone who's not even very good at what they do. I'm not gonna name any specific professions, but I think that we all have some stereotypes in our mind about middlemen who would fill that quadrant. We also have ideas about middlemen who are, who are predatory. Now these are people who can be very good at what they do, but they're not using that power 
to serve us because they're cold, right? They're interested in themselves rather than in us. I won't say much about the pet. This is more in the realm of middlemen. I think this is the mom and pop shop. This is someone who has good intentions, but really lacks the clout, you know, the market power or the ability in other ways to deliver on those intentions no matter how good they are. You know, the service is slow, the prices are high, you know, I'd rather just go to Amazon, right? So that's, the, that's what I call the pet. So of course, the, what's left is the golden quadrant, which I call the partner, and it's so convenient that it also starts with a, with a P. This is the, the true you know, good marriage. This is when two people are out for a win-win, right? What's good for me is good for you, help me, help you, that whole idea. Uh, the partner, in terms of a middleman, is someone who can enlarge the pie, like if they're negotiating on your behalf, they're able to get so much more in total that even after they take their slice, you're still better off than you would have been without that middleman helping you. So that's what you want in a partner. And so this, this general framework explains a lot about middlemen in general. But I really wanted to know more specifically about what it is middlemen do across industries that makes them valuable. Like, what are they really doing exactly? Like, what, what functions are they serving? And that's what the heart of my book is about. Everything I've said so far is just laying the groundwork. I'm going to go through six roles that I believe middlemen play across industries and even beyond business, even beyond the world of business, just in, in human relations when you have middlemen. What are they doing? How are they helping the two sides? And what I'd like to do, just sort of informally to get your feedback on how this is going, what you're relating to in this presentation, is to tweet me if you are on Twitter, just that's my handle, and um, I would ask you to use the hashtag middleman. Again, sorry about this sexist term. You can read my long end note in the book about that. But um, when you tweet that, just let me know in one word, as soon as you hear a role that you are relating to, that you are identifying with personally in your, in your work in particular. So for example, let's start with the first one. It's the bridge. This is the role I call the bridge. And I'll explain what that means. But if you hear something in this description that is resonating for you, um, I would appreciate it if you would just tweet me, at Marina Krakowski, hashtag middleman, bridge. That's all. Okay, so does anybody recognize this particular bridge? Anybody know? What's that? Um, yeah, um, it's, okay, this is a bridge in the north of England. It's a very cool looking bridge and it also has a very interesting design. Can anybody guess what is special about this bridge? Yeah, you got it, it's a, it's a tilt bridge. Right? It's a movable bridge rather than drawing open, the whole bridge tilts. Um, so this is, a, this is the, the deck, this is a pedestrian walkway, and uh, it is shaped like a parabola, just like this one, and when ships need to go under, you know, they close the bridge and they tilt the whole thing up, making it possible for ships to pass through. So I thought that was a really cool design, but really, just for our purposes, it could be a simple bridge that crosses any kind of chasm. In this case, it's a river separating two towns, Newcastle, and I believe the second one is called Gateshead, and I think this is called the Gateshead Millennium Bridge, if you guys are curious to learn more about it. Um, anyway, so <laughs> back to Middlemen. So the bridge is what, is what I think of as, as really the most basic foundational role that middlemen play. 
it's sort of the role that all the other roles build upon. You have to be, a, pretty much you have to be a bridge before you can play these other roles. So a bridge spans distance of various sorts. And I think of it in terms of three types of distance. You can have geographic distance, you can have social distance, and you can have temporal distance, distance in time. Oh, geographic distance is very simple. It's the merchant traveling to distant lands, you know, bringing back silks from China, so you don't have to, right? That's very easy to see how that kind of person is, is helpful, is, is bridging these divides. Social distance, it's more interesting and really not that surprising, especially in the age of, of social media. You know the idea that people could be close or they could be far, but they can still connect you know, in a social network. We all live in the Bay Area, uh, but we don't all know the same people. And the same can be true, gosh, within like one block these days. So for my book, I interviewed somebody who started a babysitting service, a babysitting middleman called Sitter City. And she started this while an undergraduate at Boston College. And everybody knows that Boston, the, the, kind of, the greater Boston area, probably has the highest concentration of colleges and universities of anywhere in the US, right? No shortage of college age students, you know, potential babysitters. And of course, there are also a lot of families who need babysitters, families of young children. But what this woman who started this company discovered is that women were coming to college campuses, you know, heavily pregnant women. She actually saw a woman like this, which supposedly, this is the origin story, um, this gave her the idea to start this business she saw a woman who looked to be eight or nine months pregnant, you know, climbing up stairs, hanging up flyers, looking for a sitter. And she thought, this is ridiculous. This was the late 90s, and um, Craigslist was just beginning to take off. It really wasn't a big deal in Boston. You could turn to a nanny agency, which is a traditional middleman. That cost thousands of dollars. And she realized, you know, there's got to be a middle way, you know, something between these two extremes of having to do everything yourself and, or having to pay an expensive nanny agency. And so she started the service Sitter City, a website that matches sitters with uh, families who need childcare. Very basic service initially, and that's why I just put it in that bridge category because they weren't providing it initially all of these other ways that middlemen um, serve users. But right there was a tremendous value because even within this same geographic, you know, small radius really, people didn't know each other. You had this cluster of students, this giant cluster of students, and then you had this like giant cluster of families and families would talk to each other and students would talk to each other, but they didn't really talk to each other. They didn't cross these social divides and therefore being a middleman served both sides, right? In general, being a middleman across social distance provides a lot of value to both sides. If you really are ferrying the right kind of information across this is an idea that uh, comes from the sociologist Ronald Burt, Ron Burt from the University of Chicago. Uh, he noticed that there is this pattern in social networks, this what he called a bridge and cluster pattern. You've got these clusters, people, you know, tight knit networks or loosely knit networks, but whatever, people who kind of know each other and you have one cluster here, and you have a cluster here, and a cluster here, and then there are these structural holes, these, these gaps within the social fabric, within that social network. And he noticed that there could be people who belong to both clusters, and they were ideally positioned to fill that structural hole. 
And what most of his research has focused on is the way that those bridges, he called them brokers or entrepreneurs. I like the word bridge. His research focused on how these people were benefiting the side that they were, um, but actually both sides, you might say. Sometimes you're taking something from one side and bringing it to the other. Sometimes it goes vice versa. And he was also finding that within organizations, people who served that bridging role also got paid more, they got promoted more readily. They were the people who were basically profiting as merchants of information. And what's important to note when you're, when you're trying to span that social distance is that you understand the needs of both sides so that you're not just bringing in random information from one side to the other. You know exactly what problems this one side has and you know this latent solution that this other side has. This other side thinks it's cheap, it's obvious, you know? But this side doesn't, and, and this person is able to make that mental connection, bringing in information across social networks. So there are a lot of different ways that being a bridge in a social network can create value for, for both sides and how the middleman can, can benefit from, from doing that. So Ron Bird is, is the researcher behind these ideas. And finally, I want to say there's, um, there's room for temporal distance, you know. Oh, my favorite example of this is from the world of Craigslist again. Uh, there are these people, appliance flippers on Craigslist, who make their living buying and selling used appliances through the site. So they will, you know, they're constantly scouring the site because they have to be quick. They have to be the first one to catch a deal and they know what the going rates are. They know what the good prices are on a, you know, a 2010 Kenmore or whatever it is. Um, and they'll snap it up so, you know, this guy might buy a washer or dryer for $50 on a Saturday from somebody who's just eager to get rid of it. Like this person might just be happy to even pay you to take it off their hands. It's still working, but they're moving, they're getting new appliances, whatever it is. So he's taking it from that seller, posting that same ad on Craigslist, holding it in his garage. You might say he's holding inventory, you know, for a few days until it gets snapped up by somebody whose washer or dryer broke and they, and they just need a used one quickly. And that person is often willing to pay, happy to pay $300, $350 for that same used appliance that was bought just a few days earlier. So this, this middleman is really providing a service to both sides, profiting from the difference. And the service that he's providing, one way to think of it, is he is connecting the seller on Saturday to the buyer on Tuesday. So he's a bridge in, in time. Okay. Marketers have their own term for this same idea, which is they're providing time utility. You know, you haven't transformed the appliance, so how come you're making a profit? Well, you're providing a kind of utility that they call time utility. It's the same, same idea. Okay, so that's the basic role. And, and a lot of people have told me, after I started talking about this book, they, they say to me, I'm not really a middleman, but I'm a connector, so I, I identify with what you're saying. And usually what they mean when they say that they're a connector is that they are a bridge of some sort, typically a bridge in social distance. Okay, the second role, this is a harder role to, to, to fulfill. So the certifier, I tried to find an image that represented each role, and it's a little harder with certifier because it encapsulates several ideas. Uh, the, the, the key here with a certifier is it's a, someone who is staking their reputation on the quality of the goods or services that they're selling or representing. This particular image comes from a description used by a headhunter who's explaining the value that headhunters, that a good headhunter provides. You know, this person says, a headhunter, gosh, you have to shuck a lot of smelly oysters to find the pearls, right? Very earthy, vivid image there for what he does in 
scouring uh, the internet, looking for resumes, making phone calls, whatever it is, collecting resumes for people who might not even be appropriate, interviewing them on the phone. They're able to do this very quickly. Again, they're experts at more than just using LinkedIn. Um, so what they're doing is they're shucking these oysters to find the pearls so they can present their client only the pearls, maybe an array of pearls now to choose from. So it would be very bad for a certifier to present a bunch of duds, you know, a bunch of like messy um, oyster shells, right? or yucky pearls, you know, they've already screened them. So, so there are basically three parts to being a good certifier as I see it. There is what headhunters call sourcing, um, casting a wide net. Um, I call this scouting. This is just a general term maybe used in the talent industry. You're scouting for talent, you're, you're looking around, you're going far and wide. The key is you're not just looking right in front of you. That's very obvious, that's what anybody can do. But if you are a certifier worth your salt, you are really going far and wide to, to find potential uh, products or candidates or whatever it is. And so then after you've scouted, then you're doing screening. Right? This, is, this is the vetting step. This is the, the phone interview where you quickly ask. In 10 minutes, you can figure out if this person is a potentially good match, if this is a pearl. And then finally, you're vouching, which means that you are guaranteeing that what you're saying is good really is good. And you're staking your own reputation on that. You're not gonna send over junk. You're not gonna do that like spray and pray approach that you know, some recruiters are vilified for because you know that if you do that, uh, people aren't going to listen to you next time. You're losing your credibility. You're, you're harming your own reputation. So the good ones, they're staking their reputation on the quality of what they represent. And, and needless to say, this goes beyond headhunters. This is what we see on eBay with the power sellers. You turn to them because you know that what they're going to sell you, what they're going to actually mail you, will match the description and the photograph that you see on their seller's page. And their reputation is counting on that, is, is writing on that. So that is, that is the certifier. And a certifier has to do this with both goods and services. And we were talking uh, earlier about how the line is getting blurry between goods and services. But the point here is that when you're, when you're selling goods, being a certifier is, is really enough. You don't need to take this next step of being an enforcer. Okay, um, Polly here, uh, typical image of an en enforcer, uh, this fictional character, of course, from The Sopranos. Nice man, loves his mother, you might recall. But, um, you know, if somebody crosses his boss, you know, he's willing to do anything. So this is what we often think of as an enforcer. This is a, you know, a criminal type. We have enforcers in the, uh, in the illicit economy because you can't just turn to the courts to enforce contracts, enforce property rights, and so on. So that's, that's, you know, that's obvious. Um, but what is less obvious is that you also need enforcers in the legitimate business world. Whenever there's a contract, it, it is very costly. You know, talk about transaction costs. It's very costly to go to the legal system. Um, and so you have these middlemen often playing the enforcer role. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the people I interviewed for my book is a, is a wedding planner, a very, a very good wedding planner. I had this impression just from reading her website because she really got this enforcer role. She was saying, you know, as a, as a bride, you are a one-time customer. Most brides are one-time customers of the wedding dressmaker, of the florist, of the band or DJ, or the photographer, you know, all these vendors that brides have to do business with. When you're a one-time customer, you're in a vulnerable position. As the wedding planner, I am a repeat customer. She's so right. You know, the more weddings she plans, 
the more clout she has with all the vendors in her community. So she's able to get them to deliver their very best service. So what an enforcer does more generally is they're keeping both sides honest. They're um, keeping people accountable. They're um, giving people an incentive, a simple economic incentive, um, no violence involved, to do their best work, not to shirk, um, to deliver on their promises, you know, to, to do exactly what was contracted. And it, you can see why a middleman is ideally positioned to do this, often much better than individual buyers and sellers. A very interesting enforcer middleman that you might not have thought about is in all of these online marketplaces, actually, there has to be this element of enforcement, of keeping people honest. And one person I interviewed for the book that is from this world is the founder of Open Table. Okay, Open Table, we may not even think of that as a, as a, as a marketplace, but it's you know, very much a middleman between restaurants and diners. And when the system is working well, it's working amazingly well. It's like this beautiful feedback loop where, you know, it's a two-sided market, classic two-sided market. You know, the more diners there are, the more attractive that marketplace becomes to restaurants. And the more restaurants there are, the more diners are interested in going to check out that app or that website. And it obviously serves the needs of both sides because restaurants are able to f um, make best use of their available capacity, you know, to fill those last minute slots oftentimes. And diners have the convenience of being able to make a reservation even on short notice or ahead of time without calling a whole bunch of places. So it's not comprehensive, but it's very clear that Open Table provides value to both sides. And so you might wonder, well, gosh, that's like such a brilliant idea. Why didn't anybody think of that before? It seems so easy, right? A lot of these things that seem easy and convenient and like, duh, you know, there's actually a lot of work, a lot of design that goes into making these systems work. And he told me, Chuck Templeton, the, the founder of this of Open Table told me about how they faced one particular uh, form of resistance from the restaurants. Okay. So like a lot of a lot of these kinds of sites, you know, they give the service away for free to one side, you know, to get a lot of people to sign up, and then they charge the other side that's more willing to pay, in this case, the restaurants. Uh, the restaurants didn't have so much of a problem with their willingness to pay because it would certainly be worth their while to fill those those open um, tables. <laughs> what, um, what their concern was, was no-shows. Now, restaurants hate no-shows. Someone who makes a reservation and doesn't show up, that's worse than someone who didn't make a reservation didn't, and didn't show up because it costs the restaurant, you know, the restaurant might have to turn away a diner if there's a reservation, you understand. So what they were afraid, you now restaurants always deal with no-shows, whether people are calling them up or whether they're booking through a service like Open Table, but Open Table didn't exist, and the restaurants were concerned that this service was going to make it too easy for diners to make a reservation and then not show up. Like they thought maybe the diners would would forget, or maybe kids would be. Um, doing you know pranks of, of of some sort, just making a good you know a bunch of reservations and not intending to ever show up, and so they raised this concern with with Open Table. Now, Open Table was not thinking in terms of like I need to be an enforcer, you know that's my own term, but that's really what they were doing. So they made several design decisions. Uh, one of them was they simply made it impossible in the Open Table interface to for one user to make multiple reservations for the same time. In fact, they carved out a two-hour window. So if you made a reservation for 7 o'clock at restaurant A, and then you tried to do it for 8 o'clock at restaurant B, the site just wouldn't let you do that, because who eats like that? <laughs> so that's, that's one simple you know, no-brainer rule, kind of. But, but it took them some time to even come up with that. 
They also address the problem of, of uh, cheap pseudonyms, which is really what, what uh, you know, open to what the restaurateurs were concerned about, is that it was just too easy to create an account. You didn't have to provide all your personal information. Open Table deliberately wanted to make it easy to open a new account. They didn't want to put all these hurdles in the way of, of diners signing up. But if you make it too easy, then people might create multiple accounts. Like, I don't know if anybody would really do that, but that was the restaurant's fear. And Open Table, one of the ways that they dealt with that is they created this uh, loyalty program. Okay, so they uh, reward you for eating out again and again through Open Table. And so that uh, reduces the incentive to create additional fictitious accounts. And uh, for each particular account, they also imposed a limit on how many times you can no-show. So, you know, everybody can make a mistake once in a while. It could be an honest mistake, no big deal. But after four no-shows, you are banned from using that site for the rest of the year. You're just not worth it to open table. You're, you're creating more trouble than you're worth. And there's actually a lot more to being an enforcer. It's trickier than I'm making it sound because you have to be also careful with the other side. You know, the, the restaurant also has this temptation to cheat. They can report somebody as a no-show who actually showed up just so they can save a little bit on, on the fees that, that the restaurant pays to Open Table. But Open Table is on to them because they are tracking every transaction. They are able to do this in a way that restaurants and diners um, could, simply could not do on their own because they're in, a, in the middle. They, they have that bird's eye view. You know, Actually, Uber has something that you guys might have heard of called the God's eye view. This is, this is their way of saying, you know, we can see where every driver is, where every Uber driver is at any one time. It's this fantastic vantage point. And that's um, part of what uh, middlemen enforcers do, is they, they, they keep track. They are watching your every move. And it can be kind of creepy, but it can be very, you can see how it can be very useful to both sides. So when you get into a car that's an Uber car, even though they didn't have to pass any kind of you know, licensing exam, they didn't have to buy a medallion, as you know, people um, have to do in some cities if they want to drive a cab. Um, but there's a great deal of trust in that system because you know that these users are rating each other very much the way that eBay um, buyers are rating eBay sellers. And by the way, I want to say that some of these roles can work in tandem, not only in the sense that a single middleman can be both a certifier and an enforcer, but also within you know, an ecosystem, you might have someone who is a certifier, like an eBay seller, right? They are vouching for the quality of the goods that they're selling, but they are working in a larger framework, which is eBay itself, acting as an enforcer that is creating this whole feedback system to begin with. They also have a big fraud department. And, you know, there's a lot to it, to, be, to being a good enforcer. But I just wanted to talk about this open table example because I thought you guys in particular would, would find that interesting. You know, it's, it's an app. You know, it seems so simple, but there's so much going on underneath to create trust between the two sides. The next role, it's the most abstract role I've got. And so I had to resort to a bit of a cliche here to describe it, this whole uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Because risk is a, is a tricky concept. But the whole idea here is you know, there's a lot of variability. We don't like variability. We want consistency. We are risk averse. and a middleman is in the best position to reduce risk overall because they're able to create a portfolio. So in the aggregate, in the same way that a venture capitalist reduces the risk in, a, in what is really a series of very highly risky investments. And an insurance company, you know, an insurance company uh, really doesn't know when a particular a uh, person is going to get sick, but they know statistically that a certain number of people of this age, this gender, and so on, are going to get sick in a given year, and that's how they're able to 
make a profit, you know, to price their services appropriately. And so that's what uh, risk-bearing middlemen do. And what I think is really interesting, uh, you know, in, in uh, the world of supply chain management and operations research, the way that people think about risk is often about variability of things like inventory, you know, inventory fluctuations, that's a form of risk. You know, you have a stock out risk, right? Um, you want to reduce that. You want to have this even, steady supply that, that's much easier to manage. And that's what middlemen are able to do. That's what retailers are able to do. They're, they've always got stuff on hand. Uh, the manufacturer will sell stuff at a wholesale price, which is a steep discount, because they know they've got this ready buyer who will buy a large lot of something. Um, that's another form of, of risk bearing. Right, the, the retailer middleman takes the risk that this stuff might not sell or that we don't know when it's going to sell. That's all part of the risk-bearing role. And where I think it gets particularly interesting is when risk-bearing um, goes hand in hand with being a certifier and being an enforcer. Because if you're thinking about all of these, these roles that I've described, there is this element of risk. Trust is a form of risk, right? You know, do you trust that this eBay seller is going to sell you a true Prada dress and not a knockoff, for example? That's a form of risk, right? But then there's this other kind of, so that's a form of counterparty risk. That's the risk that your trading partner is going to betray you. But then there's this kind of like, this external risk, you know, I think economists use the term exogenous risk. It's something that neither party really has any control over. And this is the kind of risk that it would be a good idea for middlemen to bear more of. And there's a really nice example in a, in a company called ZocDoc. You guys familiar with ZocDoc? Have you ever heard of this? Okay, um, ZocDoc basically is the open table for doctor's uh, appointments, right? You um, feel a cold coming on, or whatever. You feel sick, you need to see a doctor on relatively short notice. Your doctor, of course, is never available when you need her. So you go to ZocDoc and you enter, you know, you choose a category. This is the specialty I'm looking for. This is the radius I'm willing to travel uh, to, and out pops this list of doctors who happen to have appointments on that day that you're looking for. Now you see how this is a bit of a, this is a risk bearer because it's helping the doctor, it's helping the doctor deal with those unforeseen last minute cancellations, it's helping them fill that unpredictable hole in their schedule, and it's helping the patient, the would-be patient, to get an appointment just when they need it. And the reason I say that this is a risk-bearing role is that it's very much like what the insurance companies are doing. The insurance companies don't know when you're going to get sick, when you're going to get into a car accident, who's going to do this on any given day. But if they have a large enough pool of subscribers, or if ZocDoc has a large enough supply of doctors, there's a really good chance that, you know, the client, the patient can count on with pretty high degree of certainty there being an opening when they want it. Now the tricky thing, and this is how this interacts with being a certifier and being an enforcer is, how do you know that those openings are not there because this is a terrible doctor who just doesn't get enough business uh, through sheer word of mouth. You know, you do a little bit of economic reasoning, you can, you can uh, argue that a site like this, a site like ZocDoc, will disproportionately attract the wrong kind of doctor. Because what kind of doctor is most willing to pay, right, to, to, to open their appointment book to anybody. It's the one who really is desperate to, you know, there could be other reasons, but you sort of believe that bad doctors are more likely to be attracted to this kind of site, to be more willing to pay for this kind of site. This is the adverse selection idea. 
So ZocDoc has to do very much what the eBay seller and eBay itself is doing. So like a lot of sites out there, they have a rating system. So first they're, I don't know how they screen doctors initially. I know there are other sites that, that do uh, vet their doctors before they even sign them up. But what ZocDoc definitely does is once the doctor is on the site, patients can rate the doctor. Okay, And that keeps doctors on their toes. So they're playing the risk bearer role and the enforcer role. You have to, you have to do both a lot of times. Okay. okay, now here's an easier one to explain. The concierge, because we're all familiar with the concierge in a hotel. This is the, the friendly person who really knows the lay of the land. Often they will you know, give you a map. They'll tell you exactly how to get from point A to point B. They will um, maybe make a reservation for you. They just make your travels easier. They make life easier. And one of the big myths of the internet is that we don't need people like this anymore. You know, I've got my iPad. I can, I can find out all I need to know about this city without going to a concierge. And a lot of people feel that way, actually. But, um, you know, the problem with information is you can have too much of it, right? So the, you know, we talked about two kinds of information problems with, in, with respect with the certifier and the enforcer. Those are informational asymmetries. One side knows more than the other, and the middleman can kind of shift that balance, that informational balance between the buyer and seller so that the seller can't take advantage of the buyer or vice versa. Here you've got a different kind of informational problem that the concierge is, is solving, and that is the problem of information overload, you know, quite simply, right? This is the idea Herbert Simon is most associated with, the famous quote about the wealth of information leading to a poverty of attention, right? You know, the general insight here is that when you have a lot of one resource, it consumes a lot of another resource. You know, he has this colorful uh, phrase also about how a rabbit-rich world is uh, a lettuce-poor world. Okay, so there's like sort of no, no free lunch here. So everybody knows there's a lot of information online and it's a wonderful thing, but what is often forgotten is that that information consumes something. And what it consumes is time. You know, writing in the 70s, this is what Herbert Simon was already saying. You know, attention can be measured as time. And information consumes time. We know that about books, and we know that if we've done any internet research and, you know, you just jump in and you drown. So, you know, there are very obvious uh, examples of middlemen playing the concierge role. Uh, travel agents, in fact, you know, if you're planning a complex itinerary, you could do it yourself or you could hire a travel agent who specializes in that destination, who can plan the, the whole trip for you much more quickly and probably do a better job of it than you could yourself, even with the help of wonderful sites like uh, TripAdvisor, for example, which itself is a kind of middleman. But concierge is you know, very custom-tailored custom for you. And um, this isn't just on when you're buying stuff. A similar problem occurs. This isn't so much information overload as you might say tool overload. Um, let's say you're selling a used car. Again, there's Craigslist just, you know, beckoning you to take pictures, just, just write up a brief description, post a couple pictures, and next thing you know, you know, a few minutes later, people will be emailing you with inquiries and lowball offers and uh, wonderful things like that. What a middleman can do for you is uh, they will come out, the good ones, they will take, you know, they will examine your car. They will take a gazillion pictures of it. They'll take it away uh, for you. They will post it on several sites. And they've got a person working business hours who can give potential buyers a test drive. 
You know, you can go to work, you can do your thing, they'll do it for you. And that's really the essence of the concierges, making life easier. You know, I know I can do it myself, but let me do this for you, the middleman says. Okay, so I don't know if that whole experiment is working, because I personally forgot about the whole tweet thing, but if you guys, you know, if you think back now to what I've talked about now, so we've talked about the bridge, the certifier, the enforcer, the risk bearer, and now the concierge. If any of these are resonating with you in terms of the work that you do, just please tweet to at Marina Krakowski, hashtag middleman, and then just the name of the role. We've got just one more role. We're almost done. The insulator. You guys know this guy. Anybody recognize this guy? It's an intellectual crowd, I think. This is a sports agent. His name is Drew Rosenhaus. He's a super agent in the NFL. You know, this is the kind of person who makes the cover of Sports Illustrated. He's the youngest ever agent in the NFL. He represents all the big players. Uh, most of his names I don't know, but I know Drew Rosenhaus because he's a wonderful, powerful middleman who really does well by his clients in, in many ways. But the way that he's an insulator is he provides a buffer between the players and the teams. So this is quite different from the other roles because in the other roles we talked about how the middleman connects people who wouldn't otherwise know each other and makes those transactions happen uh, very you know, quickly, efficiently, and, and well done. The insulator is actually doing something for people who already are in a relationship. He's doing almost the opposite. He's keeping them apart. And there are good reasons to do this sometimes. This often comes up in negotiations. You know, there are some things that we could actually do for ourselves. Now, negotiating takes skill, and I don't want to downplay that. There's, there's a lot more to being a good negotiator than just being a spokesperson for another person. But there is really a lot to be said just for having anybody negotiate on your behalf. You know, they are able to toot your horn in a way that you would not feel comfortable doing yourself. And they're able to ask for more than you would feel comfortable asking yourself. Because when you're in a relationship, you don't want to seem like, um, like the greedy, selfish partner. You know, this goes back to that whole warmth competence thing. You want to be seen as competent, yes, so you might want to toot your own horn, but you don't want to be seen as like cold, right, and unlikable. So you don't want to. So you're in that self-promotion dilemma, and, and the same thing happens as I say, with, with negotiations. And, and he's just a master at this. You know, he'll be sitting in a press conference, and there's the athlete sitting like, like a mute person next to him, you know? Um, and yeah, maybe this is not the most articulate person in the world, this athlete, but there's so much more that Drew Rosenhaus is doing by speaking on behalf of the athlete than just stringing a bunch of words together. They're able to, like, just Say the most, you know, you listen to this guy and, you know, the guy might have uh, gotten in trouble with the law and, you know, he's totally downplaying all that. He's making this guy seem like the best um, rookie player, you know, that, that's coming through the draft this season. He's just making this guy to be great in a way that the guy could not possibly, you know, in good conscience say about himself. So I think that it's you're getting the feel for what I mean by the insulator. I just want to make clear that this is not just about athletes and, and their, you know, their agents. This, this happens everywhere. This can really happen any time that you're really afraid to rock the boat and you need somebody else to speak on, on your behalf. And I have a few um, other examples in my book. But I want to finish on kind of tying this thing together. So. Earlier, you know, we talked about transaction costs. Transaction costs are falling for everybody. Middlemen's transaction costs are falling faster than everybody else's. But there's another, another way of looking at it. Why are middlemen more important than ever in the age of the internet? And this has to do, 
This is actually an idea that came from um, a venture capitalist that I interviewed for the book. His name is Mike Maples Jr. He started a fund called Floodgate. Um, venture capitalist can you know connects investors' capital with uh, startup founders who need financing for their uh, startup to scale. He invested a lot of middleman businesses. Of course, he's a middleman himself, but he really is bullish on middleman businesses. So he was an early investor in Lyft and in TaskRabbit. Uh, there's a college textbook rental site called Chegg. Um, he was an investor in that. And he has this theory about why middlemen are um, going to be very successful with the internet. And he says that, you know, in this age where everybody and everything is connected, it makes sense that the people and entities that can accelerate connections are going to become more valuable. You've got, like, more potential connections, and those people that can accelerate connections are going to become more valuable. He has this nice network definition of what a middleman does. So I said earlier that a middleman enlarges the size of the pie. He's saying basically the same thing, but using the language of networks. He says, a middleman in a network is that person or thing in a network that connects the nodes to increase the value of the network. Right? The internet and the network connects nodes in a network to increase the value of the network. So it's not just about connecting the nodes, it's knowing which nodes to connect so that you can actually increase the value of that, of that network. And I just, I just love that definition because it explains really everything that we've talked about today. And so for, you know, for my last slide, I want to show you this, um, this diagram. Have you guys ever seen LinkedIn in Maps, unfortunately, this is a feature that they've discontinued, but it's a wonderful visualization tool they had for showing you what your own LinkedIn network looks like, what your own set of LinkedIn connections looks like if it were uh, visually mapped out. So, you know, these different colors represent uh, the clusters. Remember I was talking about clusters and bridges, right? Um, so, you know, the, like this blue cluster, for example, are employees of one company. You know, the, like the very dark blue areas, you know, very, very dense. Like these people all know each other. It's not a huge company. So they all know each other. There are some people who are more peripheral. There are some people who are more central, better connected, of course. But what's interesting is that there is this, there is this pattern, and this is true for most people's networks, you know, <laughs> you've got people in one cluster who more or less all know each other, and you have people in another cluster who all know each other and another, and there's some overlap because maybe you are all working at Apple Computer and you're also members of Baikai. So, you know, there's, these are definitely not totally discrete uh, clusters. Um, but um, you definitely see this, this pattern, okay? And then you also have bridges, and the bridges are the people who happen to know people from multiple clusters. And of course, the most obvious bridge in this ego network, you know, everybody, you know, sociologists would call the, you know, the person, the self in the middle, um, an ego network, all of a person's connections. And we each have our own ego network. Obviously, by definition, we're all the center of our own network, right? This person is positioned, you can see it so clearly in this diagram, this person is positioned as the what between these clusters? Right, they are a bridge. So just positionally, in that social network, they are the bridge. It's very easy to see. The question is, what are they doing with that bridging role? You know, it's a privileged position that we all have within the various uh, networks that we're in. But what are we doing with that? And you can't tell that from a, from a static map like this. But um, we all have this opportunity, and that's what I, that's the upbeat note that I want to end with, is that if you think of yourself as the center of your own network, this is how you can think of yourself as, as a middleman and how you can become 
a more valuable middleman is to think about these roles that you can play in your personal and professional life. It might be uh, making an introduction that is not just, oh, Joe, meet Sally, but also vouching for somebody. You know, you've made that personal connection that, that you can stake your reputation on. You can recommend a service because you've had good experiences with it. You could choose not to recommend a service if you've had a bad experience with it. These are all things that middlemen do. Sometimes you can be an insulator for a friend or a colleague. So I hope I've given you some new ways to think about middlemen and that you will use this knowledge in a, in a good way, meaning being the kind of middleman who is both warm and competent. Thank you. Questions? Well, let me, let me take the first question just because I'll, I'll be in the middle here. Um, you know, I, I'm so glad that you spoke about this, but I, I, I would wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what's the reaction you get when you try and pitch the, the recognition of the value of people who kind of see middlemen as exploiters. I was just wondering at the, at the um, at, you know, you said your book came out in September, so do you see people opening their eyes or do you find yourself defending the man yeah. as the middleman? <laughs> yeah, having to pry people's eyes open. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple message. It's not a book on, you know, how to sell, right? It's, it's a more subtle position and it's, it's harder to explain. And you see it took me almost an hour to do so today, but I think, you know, my experience has been that once people hear it, they get it, and they suddenly see, okay, I'm not just a connector. Sometimes I'm also an enforcer. You know, I just heard this the other day. So, yeah, it takes a while, but it works. Oh. I'm interested in the map you were showing. Would, would anyone's ego map not have themselves in the center as a bridge? No, no, it would always have, you know, just by definition, ego, you know, it's like all, all the nodes that are connected to, to yourself. Um, I guess the only question is whether that person is always a bridge or whether um, you could think of a child, for example, as not ever having a bridging role because their world is so small that they are only in a cluster, like they know their family members and their friends and their friends' parents maybe, right? And so all those people tend to know each other, so it's more of a clique or cluster. But for most adults, this is what the picture would look like. Yeah. And I also noticed that it appeared in that map that there were not a lot of other connections between that cluster, and that's what made that person a key person. Yeah, which cluster are you referring to? So, yeah, well, let me go back if I can figure out how to do that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there are some. Yeah, okay. So there are, I, I misremembered. <laughs> there are connections between the reds and the greens other than that key person. Yeah, and this person probably has, I mean, a lot of it depends, too, on uh, whether that linked in uh, profile is really an accurate representation of your social, of your real life in person social network. Because some people we know have, you know, many, many hundreds of uh, LinkedIn connections and they throw them out gratuitously and it doesn't really mean anything. Would you say that the, uh, just like with um, what you were mentioning about um, Bill Gates and Microsoft, would you say that the internet actually has increased? The middlemen, such as like the brokers, like um, um, beforehand, there might have been you know big um, career fairs where recruiters would go and and find candidates. Now they just rely totally on uh, LinkedIn or stuff like that. Yeah, I haven't looked at that. Although you're reminding me of a research paper I I saw about stamp. Um, you know, there were these conferences for, is it stamp collector? No, I think it was like baseball card collectors. And they found that um, a lot of those conferences died out as a result of eBay selling 
um, selling baseball cards and making it so easy for these people to connect. It would be too costly for them to go out into you know, the real world marketplace to do that. I have a question about a temporal bridge. So, um, you know, I was often the oldest guy and uh, there's an issue of organizational memory if you've been in a company for a long time. Would you consider that sort of a temporal bridge? That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, with respect to ideas, right? We're talking about ideas, information. Yeah, you're not uh, selling goods and services, but you're, sure, you're, you're ferrying ideas, and that's valuable, and that's, yeah, that, that is one way that a long timer can, can provide value. And of course, you know, ideally you have some combination of people who, are, who have that institutional memory within the organization, and then you also have people who are coming in from the outside and they're bringing in fresh ideas based on the information that they have from their past networks. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs>